Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Comic Source Podcast. I'm your host, Jace. We got a real special treat for you today. Uh, I'm joined by my pal, Rocky, from Comic Boom. And we are both very excited to welcome writer Andy Schmidt to the show to talk a little crime syndicate. Andy, thanks for taking the time to join us. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Much appreciated. Yeah, we, you know, we have both been reading uh, Crime Syndicate since it started. And Rocky, we were just talking about this before we started recording. Rocky has been all in from the beginning and having a blast with it. And I've been a little bit more on the, the kind of roller coaster ride. So I'm, I'm very curious because oftentimes there's things that, I, that just aren't clicking for me. And when I get a chance to talk to the creator and kind of get their perspective of where they're coming from, then it, it, it you know, makes me that much interested. I go back and check it out and, and I'm all in as well. So uh, before we kind of dive into that and, and where maybe the disconnect is for me, why don't you give everybody an idea of, uh, in your own words, what the elevator pitch, what, what Crime Syndicate is all about? Yeah, so um, so Crime Syndicate is on a separate Earth from the regular DC universe, in which, generally speaking, the good guys on Earth three, which is what we call it, are are evil, and and the good guys on Earth one, on Earth three, are the bad. Wait, did I do that wrong? The good guys on Earth one are bad guys on Earth three, and the <laughs> bad guys on Earth one are good guys on Earth three. So um, so the crime syndicate characters are are sort of like the evil version of the Justice League. Um, and w DC's never done an origin story for them before, how they all kind of came together. So that was that was what uh, that was sort of the impetus for for this version of the crime syndicate. Yeah. Now, how were you always a huge crime syndicate fan? Like, how, how did you get involved with uh, with the project? Did somebody at DC reach out to you and say, hey, we got this great idea for a crime syndicate story. We never told their origin. Like, give us an idea of how the project came about. Uh, so so the short version is I've been talking with DC specifically uh, of well, a few people there, but but really more more with Brian Cunningham, editor Brian Cunningham than than anyone else. And we've been talking like legitimately for a few years um, and we were talking about the types of project. I do a lot of other things besides comics. Um, and so, you know, if I'm going to go back into comics for writing or for an editorial sort of thing, it's really got to be something that, um, that really, you know, I feel like I can sink my teeth into. And one of the things that we talked about was I didn't really feel like I needed to work on like Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, any of the bigger characters. I tend to like, uh, digging into lesser known characters like your C-listers, D-listers, give me your F-listers and, uh, and let, me, let me see what makes them tick and see if I can come up with something uh, with them. And Crime Syndicate, I wouldn't quite say is a D-list, but they're not super well known. And the fact that they're villains was pretty darn fun. Um, so he said, I think I got a project that, you know, from what we've talked about might be right up your alley. And so he said they were interested in doing, at that time, it was going to be a black label book. Um, <clears throat> you know, doing a black label crime syndicate series and wanted to know if I had any ideas. And so I dug in, started doing my research and, and, you know, kind of pitched a version of kind of what came out, you know, the, the, the idea of doing like the origin story and all that stuff sort of came from those original conversations. Yeah. So I have up on the screen, if you're watching this on YouTube, the original, to, to me, this is the, the crime syndicate, you know, the, kind of the, the original. And then right. uh, yeah. <laughs> most recently in the, the forever evil, uh, storyline that, that Jeff Johns did a few years ago they yeah, came up with kind of my old a buddy David Finch right David Finch and this is David uh well actually this is Yvonne Reese uh, art but um yeah kind of a, a, a more modern take on it and yep. then you know if we if we throw yours up there and as you were mentioning the fact that for the first time we're digging into the the origin and uh, I know Rocky and he, he pointed out I, I completely missed it uh but the fact that it's the crime syndicate coming together for the first time and it's Starro and right. you know this crime syndicate is is the the evil justice league and we all know that the justice league their first mission together was against Starro so was that something that i mean obviously you wanted to pay homage was that part of your initial idea early on that hey if these guys are coming together it's going to be Starro yeah uh well yes and no i mean what i wanted was a threat that wasn't going to take up a lot of of space for like getting into motivations and machinations and like who like I didn't want to spend as much time with Star or Sorrow or whoever the villain was going to be. I wanted a villain that got me certain things, which was got me my characters together quickly, got them interacting, and was also a like worldwide global threat because part of the that first three issues is about kind of pushing other um, meta humans kind of out into the public eye, like. Um, 
because I wanted the first three issues to really change that world. Um, and that was the way to do it was bring the metahumans out. So uh, my first choice was Starro for all the sort of historical reasons that you that you mentioned. But if Starro wasn't going to work from a storytelling and a character standpoint, then, then I would have moved on to something else. But Starro was perfect for that because no one expects Starro to give long speeches and be backstabbing. And so to have something very, very, a very simple threat allowed us to spend more space with the crime syndicate characters and they are pretty complicated um their relationships with each other they all have their individual motivations so if if you're going to get into complicated stuff i'd rather it be about the your you know the characters that you're theoretically buying the book for rather yeah than, and i i want to get into kind of some of the motivations and and because i'm curious about your your process because some of them seem wildly different to me but maybe your perspective as as a writer you're, you're pulling from different things but but i did want to point out one of the things you just said there and it's exactly what I was talking about earlier, where I'm I'm missing something. And I don't. And now it seems so obvious. How did I miss it? But those first three issues, bringing the metahumans forward. I mean, that was obvious. That's what happened in the book. But the level, like you said, it changed the world. The level of menace in the world and in the story, it so obviously changed. I feel dumb for having missed it. Um, but that was, yeah. The world feels different. It feels more scary. It feels like not even just the origin of the crime syndicate, but the origin of Earth 3 in terms of becoming kind of that, to borrow a term from Star Trek, that mirror universe where things tend to be more evil than, than good. Uh, but before we dive into to more yeah. character stuff, let me throw it over to, to Rocky um, and see what he's got for you. Yeah, I, I found it really curious. Uh, I think you, I think that I've been dying for a crime syndicate series for a long time. A lot, I think a lot of people have. And, and uh, I just want to give a shout out and congratulate you because I'm looking at the sales here and you're selling better than Wonder Woman, Batman, Superman, Suicide Squad. Great job on the sales charts. I don't know what the exact numbers are, but I'm really hoping that this is going to become uh, a long term series at some point and that you're the man continuing writing it. So I thought I'd throw that out there. Second thing I want to say is, I find the complexity of the Earth 3 to be a little bit more than just black and white because the opposite of a hero is a villain. Okay, fine. The opposite of an anti-hero, okay, would be an anti-villain. And what, what, what I find interesting and the most fascinating character, and, and I, I think I, I'm wondering if this really challenges you as a writer is, you know, I look at somebody like Jon Stewart, who is one of the most interesting characters you have, the Emerald Knight. And I'm rocking my brains. I can't figure out if this guy's a bad guy or a good guy. And I didn't think I would have that question reading this series. I thought it would be black and white. And yet I find myself captivated by the fact that, geez, I don't know. Is he evil or is he not? Like, for example, I know that Jon Stewart uh, in our universe destroyed a planet Genosha. And then he became a good guy and he had a lot of guilt from that. And I'm wondering if this John Stewart, is he going to save a planet? Is he on the, is he on the side of the, of the heroes or not? And I'm wondering how, have you found yourself, have you found yourself very challenged by figuring out the moralities of the various players like Red Hood, Harley Quinn, Power Tower and what have you? Yeah. Uh, challenged. Yes. But also for me, that's where the fun is, right? The, the fun for me is that if, if we can do a book about supervillains uh, and you're not always sure that they're going to do the, the, the straight up most evil thing, that's a good thing, right? I mean, you know, when I think of the heroes that I tend to be drawn to, the heroes that I tend to like are also flawed or they're tragic in some way, or, you know, they can make mistakes or they'll sometimes make bad decisions, you know? And I think the villains are the same way. If you just do villains that are just evil to be evil, I'm going to get really bored. And probably it's not a good thing if the person writing the book is bored. Um, I like more complex characters. I like more complex you know, worlds and that sort of thing. And uh, DC was nice enough to sort of indulge my, my, my take on these things. The other thing too, um, and it's really, it's, it's really a thing where we're trying to thread a needle here. And, and for some people, it seems to be working great. For some folks, and maybe Jace is a part of what, what, what's not connecting with you. You know, we wanted to start it off by sort of going, this is the opposite of the world, you know, and then slowly kind of move away from that. Like, this is the point, this is the point where the world really starts to change. And then it becomes its own world where generally we can accept that, you know, good guys are bad and bad guys are good, but it doesn't always have to be that case or they're not bad for the reasons you might think they are, or they're not good for the reasons they might think you are. And so it starts to, you know, the, the whole notion, and this is actually in the original pitch, was we're going to start a book off of you reading evil Justice League, evil Superman, evil, evil Wonder Woman, evil Batman. And by the end of the book, 
hopefully you're reading a book about Ultraman, Superwoman, and Owlman, you know, and, and you're and you're not quite connecting those dots as much. It's a really difficult needle to thread because I also want that history. I want that nostalgia. You know, I want to, you know, I want to do homages to classic stories, but I want them to take on a life of their own at the same time. Yeah. I just wanted to add to that. I really liked how what you took with Ultraman and I know under the uh, the Forever Evil incarnation, Ultraman, his weakness is actually sunlight. And I, what I really loved what you did with Ultraman is that his weakness appears to be his loneliness. His his, his character flaw is that he's lonely, and you yeah. really and and that's really what I found. Uh, what that he really sort of stands apart that he actually he, this is an Ultraman that didn't kill his parents like the Forever Evil. Part, uh, counterpart did and and uh, and Su and Superwoman Donna Troy. She's I'm not sure exactly what her motivation is, but she she wants to have an offspring. And I love that. I, I just I'm curious as to where you're going with that. I'm I'm hoping that this is, I can just see that the machinations between the three. It's just when when I break it down in terms of the relationship between the Trinity from Earth Zero to Earth Three. Man, I'm, I'm, I'm so looking forward to where you're going with this. I so hope they extend your six issues. I mean, can you, can you give us a tease? Have you been approved for another series? I, no, no, I'm not. Oh. I would, you know, it'd be nice to tease that. And honestly, I'm actually so busy right now. I don't even, I don't even know that I could say yes if they, if they ask. Um, but, uh, but I mean, I'm having a blast. I mean, you know, for, for, for me, the six issue is at the printer. Like my work is done at this point, you know, like, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of hands off. Um, but, uh, but, you know, if you, if you want to read more crime syndicate, uh, I think they're appearing in suicide squad also. Um, yep, I know, I know Ultraman was in suicide squad, like, I think the same week that issue five came out. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and I've been a little bit aware of what they're doing. We're not like, we're not like super coordinating or anything, but, uh, I'm, I'm I assume DC has been talking with those guys as well. Um, yeah. And that's but, so interesting because, you know, again, and, uh, it hasn't been connecting with me. And I think back to that original crime syndicate, I had the picture up earlier. And then I think I didn't have a, a necessarily a problem when they were modernized when Jeff Johns did forever evil. So what, what is it about this time around that's not resonating for me? And I, I think what it, what it is, is in the forever evil story, it was the crime syndicate invading our earth, right? Earth one. And right. so for the story, I still had touch points. I still had relatable characters that I, I kind of knew, um, but you're really your your version of Crime Syndicate. It is kind of a, a reimagining, um, and and you're right. We haven't been able to predict. And Rocky was talking about it. We haven't been able to predict what these characters are doing. And in some cases, like uh, Superwoman, it's not even the same character. Um, and so I think that's where I'm I'm struggling because I I'm still looking for that. Just give me that one touchstone that I can can relate to, and and see how everything builds off that just kind of like a, a, a perspective or an anchor. Um, right. Did you think about that at all when you were building? The yeah, there were a lot of things to, there are a lot of things similar to that to think about. Definitely that like, you know, and I didn't want every character you ran into just to be evil, right? Like mm -hmm. I wanted there to be good guys and I want the good guys to be legitimately good. Um, and I listened to your review, you know, you read, you guys read up through issue five and a Alexander Luther is a good guy here. Like that's not a misdirection. He's, he is a legitimately good guy. Um, and, uh, and, you know, our Alexander Luthor isn't quite connecting with you, Jace, I remember you saying. Um, and part of that, I think, has to do with space. Um, you know, I haven't said this anywhere else. So, you know, don't quote me, you know, don't record this, don't broadcast it anywhere. But this thing was originally approved as 12 issues that were 30 pages each. Um, and then it was, all of a sudden, it was approved at six pages of 22, or six issues of 22 each. Um, and so, you know, if it feels compact and condensed, it absolutely is. You know, we were, we were planning on taking more space. Um, a lot of stuff got cut out and thrown out, but, um, but, but I decided, like, hey, I'm probably only going to get six issues. Um, like, they, I mean, they told me that at, at, from, from the get-go, six issues, and, and that's all you're going to get. Uh, so I was like, I'll throw as much into this thing as I can and have as much fun with it. You know, the first question um, the editors asked was, do you just want to chuck the backup stories? Um, and I was like, well, no, but they don't have to be eight pages. I'll see if I can do them in four. Right. Um, you know, and then the, you know, and then the 22 page front story, you know, then goes down to 18, you know, and then also half as many issues. So, um, but you know, the other big thing that I was really concerned about was just being like a super downer, right. Or being, or being, or feeling mean spirited, which I don't 
want it like i want it to be about villains but i don't want it to be mean-spirited i don't want violence just for violence sake if they're doing something violent that's okay but they should have their own reasons for it it you know it shouldn't just be too to be edgy or whatever like i just uh i'm not i'm not actually really interested in sort of mean-spirited stories and i feel like there are enough of those out there that you know if you want that you can go get it but uh, hopefully that's not crime syndicate. So there were there were a lot of things, you know, also too, you know, kind of with the world building, I enjoy world building. We only have six issues. So I want you to get to know these six characters the best, but I'd like to plant those seeds. And I, and I want you as a reader to believe that this world has existed in its entirety. You know, even these other dimensions of Earth 3, like have, have existed so that when characters come on stage, you don't feel like they just showed up like for the first time in that panel like they've lived a life before they before they show up and i i like that yeah and i think rocky and i have talked about space being at a premium so it doesn't surprise me to hear that you know initially you thought you were going to have a little more room and it explains why some of the maybe some of those moments that may have resonated with me a little bit more may have ended up on on the cutting room floor but i i still think you have done a great job of giving us characterization of these characters and in a way they do feel like new characters there are some you know recognizable traits and i'm glad that you kept the backup stories because those have been very insightful into who these characters are who these versions of of the characters are how did you go about deciding okay who am i gonna keep pretty close like ultraman and owlman probably owlman might be maybe the one that's the closest to the other incarnations we've seen before but then like Johnny Quick, it, it feels wildly different. Obviously, Superwoman is is different. John Stewart is, you know, crazy different than P- Power Ring. How did you go about deciding, you know, who was going to be overhauled more than than others? Well, uh, you know, it's a, again, it's, a, it's several different factors. But um, for me, you mentioned Owlman is probably the the most similar. Uh, for me, I remember watching the the DC animated film, The Crisis on Two Earths, mm-hmm. and just feeling like that is Owlman. Like I understand everything I need to know about Owlman. He is nihilist. He's like I like Dwayne McDuffie, who is was uh, you know a powerhouse of a storyteller, just absolutely nailed that character. So that was pretty much the first thing I said was I'm going to be writing this version of Owlman. Right. Because he's perfect. He's simple. I totally get him. He's easy to understand. But when you get into what nihilism actually means, it creates all these really interesting places to go story wise. And so like that was exactly that. Uh, Ultraman, I didn't want to, I didn't want to change all that much. I didn't want to change his look all that much. Uh, neither did Kieran, um, because Superman is, you know, Superman and Batman are the two most iconic characters in comics potentially. And so you don't want to change them all that much. So I tweaked his attitude. I tweaked his motivation a bit, but you know, you can look at other versions of Ultraman and go, yeah, that's in the same zone. Right. Right. Um, Superwoman was different because uh, the reason she changed more than than uh, Ultraman and Owlman is because her incarnations are a little bit more varied over the years. Like uh, in one, she's Lois Lane and others, she's not. Um, she worked at the Daily Planet then she didn't. She's an ambassador, you know, and I was like the whole iconography of her, I found sort of like muddled in a way that wasn't helpful for new readers not that i expected there'd be a ton of new readers for a book kind of this insular but but you know i i kind of found even just in our discussions i'm like well yeah she's she's the opposite of wonder woman but she's also the opposite lois lane and like that just felt muddy to me and so uh the original pitch was pretty similar to what we've got here uh but she wasn't a i i was advocating not to call her superwoman i was going to get rid of anything that relates her to the Superman sort of mythos, but they wanted to keep the name Superwoman, so he did. Um, But my idea was that she should be much more, you know, to start much more, much more similar to Wonder Woman. So we leaned more heavily into that stuff. And I always liked the ambassador thing. So we kind of leaned into that. And then, you know, and then it was, well, why would she be an ambassador and what's she really doing? And what's that all about? And so that kind of led into the you know, all the redesigns for her. And that costume, 
uh, is not really like it's not like a super villain costume. It's just that's what she wears when she like goes into you know Arnold DC, the capital, to, as an yeah. ambassador because she's seven feet tall and she's super intimidating. And then she's wearing this thing that like nobody else can pull off ever. Yeah. And like I just I I really wanted to do a scene of her like actually doing like ambassador business, like looking like that. Uh, but, <laughs> well, she was. You, you got a good scene in the White House there with Oliver Queen. She was definitely doing some business there. So <laughs> she yeah. was doing some business. I was I was shocked that 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 they really didn't change any of that scene. Like I wrote that. I was like, there's no way this is getting through. And they really didn't they really didn't change a thing. Uh in issue one, there was one moment of 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 pretty abrupt violence that was kind of gory and that that got flagged and that got changed which is fine with me but uh but yeah i thought that was i was surprised that the sort of the the you know the more quote-unquote sexy stuff got through well yeah i mean when she gives that line uh what is it uh it's time to give your tongue a workout yeah <laughs> like that tells us everything we need to know about this version of superwoman i was like yeah. oh okay <laughs> yeah no i i wrote that and and uh, I didn't put it in the script that I sent in, but there was a, there's another version of that script that had like the PG-13 version <laughs> uh, that I never had to send in. Um, but but yeah, so so then but once you get past those three, you know, then you're getting. I mean, there's still I, iconic characters. Don't get me wrong, but but you can you can change more. Uh, moving to John Stewart, I just thought was really interesting because um, I felt like we've kind of done how. Uh, to you know, a lot, you know, there's a lot of how comics out there, and I've always been more of a John Stewart Green Lantern type of fan. So that that just opened up a whole new possibility. And then it was actually my brother I was talking to uh, uh, who came up with the with the name Overlords of Oa. You know, I had said something about wanting the Owens to be evil. He's like, oh, you mean like they're the Overlords of Oa? And I was like, I will write that down and take full credit. Thank you, Arnie. Um, <laughs> Uh, and so, so that's why that's, you know, and then, Emer and then once I got into John Stewart and what he'd be like on this world and trying to, you know, I don't want, I, you know, I knew there were going to be these six backups. I don't want them all to read the same. Like they're all, they, they all follow kind of a formula. They're all about sort of the, the moment at which things sort of changed for them. And they, they decided to go down sort of the path of villainy or they went down the path of villainy, whether it was a decision or not. Um, but I also didn't want them to feel the same. So Owlman's story isn't an, an origin in the sense that like you, you know, you, he trains and he becomes Owlman. He's pretty much Owlman the whole time there, you know? And, and so, you know, that his changes uh, just went about that way. Uh, the reason Johnny is so different is because I kind of found all the versions of Johnny to be fairly lackluster uh, in the past. Like he seemed to be the one that's just, oh yeah, he's the, he's the evil flash. And sometimes he's a drug addict, which I didn't want to do that. I don't want to glorify that. Um, and sometimes he's this, and sometimes he's that, and yeah. But you killed him off. You killed him off. Yeah, we killed. Johnny him. Quick is dead. At least uh, you know, unless that's might be some misdirection there. But I won't put you on the spot. But uh, he's definitely uh, he's one he's one sick puppy. Yeah, sick he puppy. is. He is the. Um, yeah, you know, issue five was really interesting because that's the, the you know for anybody watching listening to this that, that hasn't read it like that's the issue that where he's the focus character um and yes he does get killed but it's also the one with the backup story and he is you know in the first four issues he's the one uh you know and, it, and even in the opening of issue five where you realize he's got literally dead bodies like stuffed in the barn <laughs> um like this is an evil guy like this is the this is the type of of character that you know like detectives on on not very good documentary shows will be like i knew this guy was evil the first time i met him there's a hollowness in his eyes and you know all that like pure evil and that's kind of the way i wanted you to feel about him without again without getting too gory and going too super dark with it all the time and then give you a backup story where you could go well am i allowed to swear on this i don't know where you know, <laughs> yeah or crap like if i had lived through that i'd be pretty messed up too maybe you yeah. know i wouldn't hopefully i wouldn't be that but well, I, I thought I, I thought it really hit me when the reaction that you scripted Ultraman having. I mean, even Ultraman was taken aback by the choreo of Johnny Quick, and you know, he couldn't believe. You know, I thought it was very character revealing about Ultraman even reacting to Johnny Quick. Why would he kill his own family? And uh, because Ultraman went out of his way, despite despite not being a big fan of his own family, he just he needs some he needs some connection. And I, I thought that re really worked well that that offset between Ultraman and Johnny Quick. 
Yeah, that that uh, that line from Ultraman actually came late. That I think we did that. If it wasn't letter, if it wasn't on the lettering, it was right before the lettering. We we altered that line, and I think Andre. I think that was. I don't know that the line specifically was Andrea's. It may have been. I just don't remember. Um, but Andrea was like, "Is there something we can that he can say here?" Where he was shocked, and she was like, "Is there something we can say that reveals more character about him?" And I was like. Yes, because this the second arc the second arc changed a lot <laughs> uh, from what I had initially pitched. We won't get into all that, but it changed a lot. And one of the ways it changed is that it became and like I was already like writing issue four when all these changes were still happening. Um, it became much more uh, again about Ultraman and his loneliness. That theme was coming back again. It wasn't necessarily originally there because he wasn't one of the focus characters in the last in the back half, the back three. But it came back and it works really well. Um, and so that became a really great place to have something that again sort of brought up that loneliness and, and showed that. So uh, so you can thank Andrea for that one. Um, but yeah, that's. But th those are those things. Like it's it's like, hey, there's there's eleven word balloons on this page. How many of them can we get to actually give you more character? Like, what can we do to make sure that as often as possible you're getting deeper into this thing? I mean, not you, Jace. You're not. You're not <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, I'm 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 lost out in the weeds. Uh, we say that's, that, <laughs> that's Andrea Shea, who's the editor uh, on the yeah. book. And she's a, she's a right. fantastic talent, and and that's a very good real world ex example of what a good editor will do to you know, improve a story and, and get the writer to, to see things in a different way. Cause so often people, Oh, well, what editors do, they do that. They make the story better. Good, good ones uh, do that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And Marquise has been great too. Uh, I think he's the only, I think he's the only editor that's credited on every issue. Um, he's awesome. Uh, super enthusiastic. And uh, I'll type in the little captions, the little editorial notes, and then he'll often like revise them in his own language or, or right. tweak it. And, and they're, they're, always funnier once he <laughs> I love yeah I love when they get a little humorous when yeah th th that's great and I love that they've come back those kind of editorial notes disappeared from comics for a long time and I, I always missed them because they were there as a kid and they have nostalgia um, yeah that was a fun idea that I that I pitched and part of the reason to pitch it was yes to have fun to help keep the book a little bit lighter but also to sort of like you know hint that it's a whole world right that yeah. there are other series going on out there and that sort of thing and so uh and they react like when i sent that email of like could we do this they were like yes we can do that and then they went and checked with legal and then they came back and said yes we can do that but we can only do it twice an issue <laughs> oh twice an issue. fantastic <laughs> we snuck a third one in i think in issue in issue four or five there are three but shh, don't tell well me. Uh, the thing about jo Johnny Quick, I, I will say this, because uh, I thought issue five was pretty successful in what you were just talking about in terms of he, he to me, is the most unlikable character. But 100%, when you read that origin, that backup story in issue five, you totally understand. It doesn't redeem him in the sense that you forgive him for what he's done or say what he's done is okay. Right. But you understand, like, hey, there but for the grace of God go I, right? So I, I think that was... Uh, fantastic but um with these changes and, and it makes complete sense what you said you know you keep owl man you know m the most the same and then you know from ultraman down you can kind of start changing things more and more and i i, I really do appreciate it. it surprised me that it was john stewart and not hal jordan but the more i think about it the more it does make sense we've already even in earth one with parallax we've seen the evil version of of hal jordan so why not give us something different um, how's the reaction been from readers and on social media and people reaching out with these changes? Have people seemed to embrace them or has there been more pushback? Uh, I think, I mean, maybe they're just being nice to me. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> I mean, I haven't had anybody like come after me on Twitter about, you know, or anything where we're saying that, that oh, I've ruined crime syndicate for every generation to come. Um, you know, uh, but, uh, I think for the most part, they've been pretty well embraced. I mean, it seems like the series has got some fans that like are really, really digging it. Um, and then it's got some other fans that are enjoying it. And then it's not connecting with a few people, you know, and uh, or not connecting fully with a few people. And, th and I mean, I think I just described every comic ever, but, <laughs> um, but uh, uh, yeah, no, so far, I mean, everybody's been, everybody's been great. Um, the folks at DC have been really, you know, supportive of, of the book and, um, and uh, yeah, no, it's been, it's been pretty pleasant. And look, you know, for, 
for viewers and listeners that, that you know don't know my background i've been in comics more or less since 2002 you know and i was an editor at marvel for a number of years and, and an editor at idw i worked at transformers and gi joe and dungeons and dragons and you know all kinds of star trek I've, I've worked on just about everything that i loved as a child um i've had the pleasure of working on it one time or another and i have run into some fandoms that are uh not very nice uh and so far all the dc fans i've run into have been have been pretty spectacular that's good. i'm curious are you uh how the extent of the editorial collaboration uh it's it's been uh i'm just curious because dc's heading into infinite dc infinite frontier and uh Earth 3 is part of a larger multiverse. Has there been a lot of collaborations? Uh, you sort of hinted that you weren't really involved with the overlap in, in the Suicide Squad. Was that the case? Were, were you basically allowed, given a lot of freedom to just create your own story and that was it? Or was there some degree of collaboration uh, with, with other writers and the larger vision for the DC universe moving forward? Yeah, uh, I think, you know, uh, the Crime Syndicate book started before the Infinite, uh, frontiers thing sort of got decided and locked into place. I, the first thing that I was hired by DC to write was actually the Generations series. Oh, uh, gotcha. Yep. Um, which then changed into what came out as Generations. It was originally something very different. Um, uh, and I and of the five writers that were on it originally, I was the only one that actually wrote a script and and turned it in because I was writing the first one. Um, and then it got, it got changed after the first script came in. Um, but, uh, but, but crime syndicate sort of was started like back when that whole thing was the plan. And then the plans shifted. There was a lot of, a lot of changes at DC and it was kind of brutal, you know, watching people leave those offices sort of the way that that, that happens at, at large corporations. Um, and so just a lot of things were changing, but crime syndicate had been approved. And so it just sort of stayed the course. And then as infinite frontiers sort of galvanized, uh, that's when March was picked as a release date. This will be part of it. But by that point we were already several issues in. Um, and so there, there really wasn't a whole lot we could do to, to, you know, retrofit it. So in, in, uh, you know, in the sense that like, Hey, we, we pretty much got left alone, which was, which was great. Cause frankly, I don't really need to be a part of a big crossover thing. Like, uh, I don't think that's ever been fun for anyone um, except readers. Readers love it as a reader. I love it as a creator or an editor. It, they're kind of nightmarish. Um, but, uh, but I think for that reason too, like there were other things that were decided that they were going to do with crime syndicate and they just decided to kind of leave us alone. You know, I don't, I don't think we, um, you know, the stuff going on in Suicide Squad, I don't think, you know, changes anything with our book. Um, so. Yeah. What did you think of Suicide Squad? You know, I only, huh? I only read, I'm trying to think, I, I think I read the two future state issues because they were a little bit concerned that I would be upset because they're essentially dead yeah. <laughs> in it. And I'm like, so we're launching a new crime syndicate. And the first time we see them, they're all dead. <laughs> Great. Like, thanks for that, guys. It's not written in stone, though. I don't Right, it's not written in stone. Oh, well, that was their whole thing. It's not written in stone. It's not written in stone. I'm like, well, what, you know, whatever. It's, it's fine. Like, you know, I, I like to think I have a healthy attitude towards these things, which are DC owns these characters. DC has to put out 70 comics a month or whatever it is. I guess it's less now. Um, but they're all double sized. Um, but, uh, you know, like I don't, I, I get invested in what I'm doing. I get invested in the characters that I am writing. Uh, and, a, and a part of me kind of falls in, uh, falls in love with them. But I have been around long enough not to get so invested that I ever lose sight of the fact that these are not my characters. Um, and that ultimately anyone can come along right after I'm done or while I'm doing it and contradict me and that's not for me yeah. to, yeah. you know, that's, that's it's a waste not. of energy for me to get angry about it or whatever. So, yeah. so I was like, Hey, I hope they're doing great things with these characters. And, um, you know, as long as these characters are, you know, I hope the characters stick around, you know, like I said, right now, there are no plans for me to be involved, uh, going forward. Uh, and that's okay. Um, I've got a lot of other things to do. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, I hope that the crime syndicate books keep, keep going and, you know, somebody, somebody gets to take over and have a great, great time with them. And if they don't follow the blueprint that I laid, that's okay. You know, you want the new person invested in the book, right? You don't want them feeling tied to the things that we did. You want them to come up with their own stuff. 
Well, I, I feel like even though it may not be resonating with me yet, and again, you could totally stick the landing and I could love issue six and then go back and reread the whole thing with that perspective of the ending and, and it could change everything. And it might, may just be, and this happens to me a lot, where something doesn't connect with me the first couple times I read it, but then when I go back and I read a big chunk of the story, you know, or maybe the whole thing in this case, I, you know, my perspective changed. Like, oh, I see what, you know, with the kind of the knowledge of, of you know, how it all ended or, or the whole overall story, it, it changes my perspective. But I think regardless of that, you've laid a great foundation um, of this version of, of Earth 3 that I think a lot of writers would love to come in and, and pick up the toys and be able to, to work with them because you haven't done it in such a way that these characters aren't still able to be malleable for another writer to, you know, give perspective. There's hints here and there, but you haven't done so much to where, you know, and, and to your point earlier about making things black and white because you've kept it in the gray area. It, I think it allows for a, a lot of writers and a lot of creative freedom, which it probably goes back to what you're saying earlier about you love, you know, give you the C or the D or even the Z list characters. Cause you do have that freedom to make more changes and to tell the best story. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's why I like to, and, and I think that's more what I'm known for. I mean, even in the work that I do outside of comics, I'm often brought in to go, okay, this was a thing 30 years ago. It may not even have been a big thing, but what, what you know, and then like I will deconstruct things for companies, whether they're entertainment companies or toy companies or whatever. And I'll, I'll go through, I'll do the research, I deconstruct them, and then I kind of rebuild them in a way that you know, where we think will res they'll resonate for today's audiences. And that's even what I was doing back, you know, in editorial, you know, the thing from an, as an editor that I'm probably best known for is rebooting GI Joe and doing GI Joe Cobra, uh, which was, which was very different and very edgy for GI Joe. Um, and, you know, when I was at Marvel doing Annihilation where we re redeveloped the Guardians of the Galaxy, um, you know, so it was really kind of during those and Madrox, the multiple man, I did the mini series that led to X Factor from that. And those were all those sorts of things. They were like, and I didn't realize what I was doing at the time that that was like a thing that I really liked doing was taking something smaller and seeing if we could build it out bigger and resonate more. And that sort of has been a big piece of what my career really has become since then, which is a lot of fun. Yeah. And, and actually, I mean, it's, you don't, you didn't get a piece of that Guardians of the Galaxy money, did you? Pro probably not. <laughs> Would have been would have been nice. <laughs> no, 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 you see, that's a wall, not a window. To like five more houses behind me. No, I didn't get a piece of the. You know, Marvel did it. Marvel did a, a. You know, it was a nice thing. I understand it. It didn't cost them a whole lot of money or anything. But uh, when that movie came, because I left Marvel in two thousand seven, that movie didn't come out till two thousand fourteen. Right. Um, uh, but they sent me an email and they invited my wife and I to the to the red carpet premiere in L.A. Oh, and cool. so we oh, went nice. out there and got to see the advanced uh screening and see it. we got to see all the pretty people from a distance we didn't get to <laughs> we didn't get to hug them or anything but right. uh Pop -nub. But yeah it was really cool it was that that was super fun because my wife isn't really into any of this stuff never has been and we've right. had a very good arrangement our entire relationship which is she was an actuary uh like really high level math stuff so uh, I wouldn't ask her to read comic books. She wouldn't, doesn't ask me to do math and it works out pretty <laughs> darn well. Um, but we went up there and she does, she does watch TV and movies. So we went up there and she was like, so what, why are, why are we here? What did you do? And I'm like, okay. So back when we were in that one bedroom apartment, you know, and, and all that sort of stuff. And I remember like sitting there and like, we're sort of, like the, the cast of agents of shield was right in front of us in the row, right in front of us. And, Andy Lanning and some other friends were like right behind us and Nathan Fillion's like three seats over and you know they were just surrounded by like the glamour and the glitz and all this sort of stuff and I remember as like when the lights went down and the curtain because they actually had one of those old school curtains that like literally right. opens up that thing opened up I remember just like this moment of sheer panic of like I spent years on this you know not that other people didn't contribute other people contributed tons and tons and tons to it but like I legitimately spent years working on this what if she hates it? Like, uh, and yeah. I had this like pit in my stomach, like, what if this thing sucks? Like really <laughs> sucks bad. And I will be like, I'll be mortified if my wife just like hates it. And then the opening, you know, just during the opening credits when, when, uh, when, uh, when um, uh, Star-Lord is dancing around and singing into the alien rat and all that stuff. And she, as soon as she started laughing, like all of that went away and I was like, okay, 
we're good. We're in, we're comfortable here. So yeah, they want to. Well, yeah, she obviously was excited. You got to be the cool kid for once, and that could have all gone away if she hated the movie. <laughs> right? So. Yeah. No, I think I would have been. I think she would have divorced me. That's what I think. <laughs> like you're a loser. I'm out. Uh, well, it's fantastic, and and from that perspective, you have done an incredible job of of refreshing and giving us a different version of the crime syndicate that I think you know, regardless of what Rocky was referring to earlier about fitting this into the, the infinite frontier era of the DC universe, despite the fact that you started this well before that, it fits in aesthetically perfectly with what DC has done with future state and what they're trying to do with infinite frontier. Would you agree with that Rocky? Uh, I would, uh, well, as a story, it's, it's, it's great. Uh, in terms of perfectly, I mean, there, there's a number of things going on. There's each individual Earth has a totality satellite, which in theory, Earth 3 should have one too. So this was written before Infinite Frontier. So we, we crashed through that in issue two. Yeah. <laughs> oh, really? That's what that was. No. Oh, really? Oh, no. Okay. This is the first time hearing about a totality okay. satellite. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's completely unfair to you because you it was all written beforehand. And I, I but, I, but that's, I think, in, in the larger editorial sense, I think DC is they've got a lot of moving parts and there's a lot of, there's a lot of little flaws here and there, but, uh, but no, for the, look, th this, this is, you know, I'm going to say again, this is just a bundle of joy and fun for me. And, and I love it. And, and the questions I have, I feel, I mean, I'm asking all these schoolboy questions. I feel like, I mean, I want to ask you, where's Lois Lane. Okay. You rejected Lois Lane for Superwoman. Is she going to be an issue six or not? Don't say anything. Uh, I want to find out myself, but you know, is she on this world? Where's Lois Lane? Also, uh, I, I know I got to quickly ask this. I know that everything's the opposite, but intelligence doesn't, you know, you know, Batman, like in, in the normal scheme of things right. in the mainstream universe, we Batman is the second smartest next to Lex Luthor. At least that was the, that's the, at least the pre-death metal sort of continuity of Lex Luthor's the smartest followed by Batman. And I'm wondering, is it, are they, is that the same sort of, is intelligence flipped uh, or is it, how, it, how uh, smart is Owlman compared to Lex Luthor? L well, Alexander Luthor. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have, I didn't flip that intentionally because I don't know that I ever would have said that Lex is smarter than, than Bruce Wayne. Have no, they really enough. ever gone head to head? Like, is that is that like an established <laughs> thing in DC continuity now? Uh, no, well, you know, who's smarter? They took an idea. I think people test? can argue about it. People can argue about it. <laughs> but right. but I, I'm more interested in your perspective in terms of how you approached it when you think about it writing script. No, you know, I, the way that I looked at everything being flipped is is it is a guideline, right? It is it is the starting point. And so I see that as like the starting point. And then um, this is also why issue one starts with the assassination of JFK is like, th that is sort of the, the point of departure for the world. Uh, I mean, obviously JFK is different. Like he's where, like he's more, much more of a dictator, right? So there are differences already, but like, that's the point that the, that meta -hu the first meta human sort of is public. And, and so for a lot of, for a lot of what we were working at was, well, what's the point of departure? And then like, you know, you don't just want to do like, the opposite of the Judas contract and then the opposite of the, of the, you know, of the, our world's at war and the opposite of crisis on infinite earths where multiple earths get created or I don't know what happens in the opposite of crisis, you know, <laughs> but like you can, you can just sort of, you can opposite yourself so many times that you wind up back where you exactly where you started. And right. I'm not really interested in retelling those stories. Like even stories I love, I don't really want to reboot and retell them exactly. I want to take those characters and see where they go next and see where they evolve. And so, you know, there were there were two things in my initial proposal that I said I didn't, I, you know, I wasn't really interested in doing. And one was sort of taking an event and really doing a, doing just like a complete opposite where, it, you know, it would wind up being predictable, right? I don't, I don't want everything to be predictable. I don't fool myself into think that no one will see twists coming or whatever. But, um, but and then the other story I didn't want to do is I didn't want to do the story where Earth three goes to Earth one or Earth one comes to Earth three. Like I've a I've seen that is the story I've seen a, a whole bunch of times. But B, I, you know, again, I wanted to establish Earth three as its own thing. In fact, when this was a twelve issue series, we there was a a really I thought really funny fake out that I was trying to pitch and it didn't go anywhere. But the the idea was that you know characters that were clearly the Justice League characters were going to be seeing this alternate version in Earth three, and then and and that would build up to a clear cliffhanger where the justice league arrives um and owl man you know of course is or whoever is going to be there and says you know who are you guys 
and then you were going to see the Justice League in all their glory, and Batman was going to say, me? I'm the goddamn Batman. And then that was going to be the cliffhanger, and so it was not going to be the Earth-1 version of the Justice League, so that was going to be its own you know, flip if we did that. Uh, that got shot down pretty quick. Uh, <laughs> but I always liked that idea. I thought that was pretty funny. Um, but, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I don't, I, you know, the, 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 the thing about these books is like, I, I love the work. Like I love the craft. I love building these things. Um, but I also try not to lose sight of like, they are fun and they should be different and you should be adding to the sandbox, not just moving the sat- sand around. Like if I can throw a few new toys in, that's awesome. Right. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, I want you to have fun reading it. I don't want you to be marveling at, at oh, look at what, you know, look at how well Kieran draws everything. Like, I do want you to notice how great Kieran is because he's amazing. Yeah. But, you know, I don't want you looking too much at like at how the sausage is made. I just want you to enjoy it. And there is a point, you know, again, it's on a sliding scale for everybody. There's a point where you can kind of over overcook these things and i, I think we are i think we're dangerously close to overcooking this because it is jam-packed with stuff <laughs> well yeah i mean it goes back to what you're saying about you know having to cut the amount of issues in half and i can't help but think about that alternate reality where all we got all 12 issues because it would have I, I think this story in this world that you've created deserves that deserves wow. that extra real i would love that yeah. What are you going to say, Rocky? Oh, I appreciate that. No, I was just curious. Uh, I'm curious, uh, Andy, in your head, do you, do you have an origin for the Red Hood Harley, Harley Quinn by chance? I do. You do? I so, do, but probably okay, someone I, else will write the real version. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Man. Yeah, because I, I was really curious. Yeah. It's definitely it's uh, it's definitely black label material. Really? <laughs> <laughs> but you crippled her, too. You crippled her. So is she going to become like a twisted oracle now, now that she's crippled by Owlman? So uh, I will say this, uh, the Legion of Justice does appear in issue six. Um, so you will, you, you've not seen the absolute last of her, but um, I, you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting. Cause I felt like, yeah, I went into issues one through three going like, in some ways, this is sort of, you know, by the numbers, it's an origin story. It follows a certain structure. It does these things. And then within that, you're looking for places where you can depart and you can make it unique or fun or whatever. Uh, in the, in the back three issues, I was like, okay, we did that. Now let's see if we can surprise people with the actual story and the plot mechanics and that sort of thing. So I hoped that when we were introducing the Legion of Justice, that that issue five is more or less what people thought issue six was going to be. That issue issue five is really the crime syndicate versus the Legion of Justice. So I was kind of hoping that issue five ends and you're like, wait, so what's issue six going to be? <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully that that you know some people had that kind of reaction and and we'll take it into some interesting places in the next issue and well i feel like that's one of the big changes that you that you made that i really like um because traditionally in earth three there's only one hero and it's alexander luther and he doesn't even have any powers you know he just is like the smartest guy alive and has created all these weapons and jetpack and whatever um but you you've introduced so many metahumans and like you said earlier some of them are heroes you know there is this um this group that is banded together led by alexander luther who is who is so different than and in a way i guess it goes back to what you said earlier because when you want to talk about black and white the old school alexander luther from earth three was the whitest knight was the whitest character was the (laughs) pillar of like he put superman to shame his morality and sense of justice and always doing the right thing. Like you want to talk about a boy scout. This is the boy scout to end all boy scouts. Um, your Alexander Luther is, is, is wildly different. Give us a little bit of the backstory in, in developing his character and, and what you wanted to say with him. Well, I wanted to show that, that the world had really good people and that, and that, and that it had people that cared about, the rest of society and about society itself like that like he's, he's not interested in society crumbling he's trying to make society better um he's got these charities and that sort of thing and then you know um one thing you guys got uh, um in your review you were talking about uh vandal savage that's lonar of the new gods 
that is a pre-existing oh, really? character uh oh. and the horse he is on is thunderer his robotic horse so he is he is an obscure <laughs> granted uh but for whatever reason i've always liked him as a new god um and i didn't realize this because i originally wrote him and i was like well this will be the earth three version of of lonar and they're like no the new gods there are no alternate versions like they are the same so so that is the same lonar that exists in earth one should lonar ever bother to show up <laughs> but um but yeah he's so he's got access to that like new genesis technology but what was really fun was once we had that discussion i was like well that's cool that makes the fourth world guys special and the fourth world jack kirby's fourth world the new gods mr miracle forever people all that stuff is my absolute other than calvin and Hobbes, that's my favorite comic <laughs> book uh ever um but uh so then i was like oh great well then he's actually from new genesis and so then we'll do like the reverse of sort of the intergang that originally introduced the new gods characters and it's it's that lonar and the the new genesis the good guy new gods um are like seeing these other worlds and going this world is screwed up we need to help them we need to give them the tools and, and build them up for success and they like choose alexander luther so there's a hint in there i can't remember if it's in issue five i think it's in four that like all of LexCore's technology and everything is based off of yeah i remember the, reading that the kirby tech right and so but now he's in charge of like thousands and thousands of employees maybe even like millions in this place and so like he's really struggling with the fact that like all of those people depend on him not to screw this company up. Meanwhile, he's got Lonar going, hey, we got to go kick these these guys' butts. And he's like, okay, that's important, but I can't let the company fall apart because then millions of people are going to be out of work and that'll be devastating. And, right. you know, so I was trying to just get into what is a good person who is successful? Like, how are they trying to function? And what is it that they're up against that's different from from Earth One? And that was sort of the the, the take on that and you know and then having Kara as the assistant was really fun and um I saw some people definitely picked up on that you know in issue four and that's fine you know we, we let the bread we put the breadcrumbs there and so people had picked up on it but then it seemed like even those people that did pick up on it got a kick out of that last page of issue five so oh yeah well with Ultraman being so important and and, and focused on, on family now that he's his his actual cousin is there that's definitely going to change the dynamic for Ultraman. And uh, if, if Cara Zarel has the same relationship with Lex as she has has had in, in, in DC's uh, mainstream past, it should, should be pretty interesting. You know, it's it's good. And I, I love I love the I love the outfit, too, there that artistically that did, did you contribute to the style of the uh, when you collaborated with the artist? Did you leave it up to the artist? 100 percent Kieran on Ultra Girl. Yeah. Um, um, the. Uh, so I weighed in, Brian and I weighed in on the original six crime syndicate designs as we were trying to get a feel for the book. And then pretty much after that, Kieran would turn stuff in as long as everybody else was happy. I was happy, you know, I mean, he's the guy that has to draw the stuff. So, you know, I'm assuming he's turning in designs he likes. So, um, you know, the one we kind of went back and forth on a lot because we were just trying to figure out, you know, what the... <laughs> There was so much beyond just designing Emerald Knight, like because Emerald Knight suggests the Emerald Knights, like the the evil Green Lantern Corps, and what is it that the Owens are doing, and how is that all different? Like there was, like once you start going down that rabbit hole, so Emerald Knight's design changed a lot. I th I love I love where Kieran wound up with it, um, but yeah, most of the most of the Legion of Justice characters and all that, it was just like. Kieran, here's basically what we're thinking. This is where we're coming from with who these characters are or who they might be, you know, sort of loosely based off of. And then he would turn in, he would turn in designs. I think the one exception to that was Savannah um, because there was that, that, you know, old now, I remember when she was new, uh, Titans character, Panther. And we all just kind of liked that design. Oh, okay. So we wound up, so we wound up using that Panther design that, I can't remember if that was a Perez design uh Perez design or if that wound up being a Tom Grummet design but I, I uh, thought she was the opposite of Vixen but she's the opposite of Panther is that right or what? yeah yeah she's really the opposite okay. of 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 Panther not that anyone okay. other than you know <laughs> Kieran and a handful of editors at DC probably know that but um yeah, it was interesting too because I would write these little bios of like all of those characters like where they came from and you know what their you know what their differences are and you know what their histories are and and a, a lot of that I don't think ever you know, makes it to the page. Um, like, you know, we don't say like that um, power towers from the Philippines. Like we don't ever say that, but she's 
depicted with you know a darker skin tone and mm-hmm. you know her name is Davina and all that stuff so you know it's there if you look for it if you want to read into it yes there's a whole backstory you know there's a backstory of why she you know trusted somebody that she shouldn't have trusted and like all this sort of stuff which will probably never see print and that's okay and another writer may come and do something different and that's okay too um you know I don't know. You, this, you, don't, you don't have a secret database where you have a, a Bible I, I, that I, you can give to a future writer to help them out or what? I mean, if ever anybody ever asked for it, yeah, I've got a couple of spreadsheets with about 150 characters on them. Oh, um, wow. That's so cool. You know, different locations, all <laughs> kinds of stuff. Yeah. I mean, we did, we, we did some deep diving, like, and you know, on that spreadsheet, like on that spreadsheet is, uh, uh, you know, Gotham City. Like one of the things we were doing with Gotham City is that there was, you know, in the past, Owlman cleaned out all the metahumans out of Gotham City, which is why in issue two, you can see them in the floor in the owl's nest. That was but awesome. On, on that spreadsheet, all those characters are listed there and they're like deceased in Owlman's floor, you know, like, <laughs> you know, so so some of the characters are dead and they're all on that spreadsheet too. But, you know, then we've got others, but, you know, for that massive scene and, uh, you know, when, you know, in Arnold DC, when, all the starro infested characters come out um <laughs> i had like the funniest conversations with editorial about that they're like well why are why is it these characters and i'm like well because the doom patrol in this world are based in arnold dc because of this this version of niles calder is working for the government here and they're like where are you getting this from and i was like it's all in my brain <laughs> you know, like like you know or, or like hey we should see this character i was like we can't see that character they'd have to fly here from new orleans that's ridiculous <laughs> you know as if anything in crime syndicate would be ridiculous but of course to my brain that has all this stuff like organized and mapped out you know i'm like no and then, you know at some point i think marquise or somebody was like uh what what's wrong with you and i'm like i don't know i just put a lot of work in this also i love the doom patrol and so i figured this might be my one and only shot to actually see the doom patrol in a comic i write so I was like, so that's why the Doom Patrol are in it. That's what it really, really boils down to. But I had this whole backstory to justify it. It was very funny. Yeah, it sounds like you had a lot of fun doing this. Oh, I had a great time. Yeah. No, I mean, I had a, I had a blast. Uh, I had a blast working on this stuff, and and it really is. It this is my kind of thing, right? Give me those, you know. You know, I might, I, I might not have time to come back and do anything right now, but I mean, I'd have to consider it if they were like, okay blue devil go i'm like okay all right <laughs> oh, i'll man. find 20 i'll find 20 hours 25 and 26 in the day i'll work it in you know or you know name your name your d-list character but yeah. i've been wanting the blue devil series for quite some time it has been a long long time and the I last was... couple times he showed up he's not even recognizable i need somebody to bring me the you know the dan cassidy that i remember um, yeah we, we need dan cassidy uh yeah. and it could be a different version of dan cassidy but i think i think somebody needs to <laughs> he still has to be a we weirdness should, he still has to be a weirdness sh- magnet though we shouldn't go down the blue devil hole because because that's a whole other like that's probably a three-part episode series <laughs> um but yeah no i blue devil has not really felt like blue devil to me ever since they made him i forget exactly what they did was it in day of judgment or was, I yeah. think it was before day of judgment they turned him into like this demon i don't know they made him all like mystical and stuff and i'm like yeah, i yeah. think you're missing the point taking him too seriously yeah Yeah. he's not the weirdness magnet then i don't want to read about him yeah it's like i think there's there's a like there's like a a funnier version of grant morrison doom patrol take on blue devil that's just waiting to 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 take the world by storm and become a a hit tv show on hbo max hopefully hopefully dc's dc's listening uh but getting back to uh what we were talking about with um the artistic collaboration and and whatnot um after you saw the designs that, you know, for, for all the characters, including the, the, the uh, Legion of Justice, was there anybody that kind of rose in your estimation in terms of, oh, I like this character a lot more just based on the design that Kieran was able to come up with? Uh, yeah, Atomica. Um, uh, l- largely because Kieran, I think, just said in an email that he was basing her, uh, her like her hairstyle and and body build off of uh, Naomi Nagata from the expanse, oh, gotcha. uh, which is like one of my, which is one of my favorite TV shows. And then like, once I started thinking of her, I was like, well, she, Naomi's like this awesome character. So I need to be putting more effort into Atomica. <laughs> so that uh, Atomica definitely. Um, and then uh, actually Emerald Knight, the, 
once the visuals of Emerald Knight sort of galvanized, everything else started to click into place and things changed. Like his story arc has changed the most from beginning to end. You know, he wasn't originally going to be the main character of the, of issues four through six, more or less the main character of issues four through six. But now I think the whole thing hinges on him. And I think that's for the better. And in part because Kieran just kicked butt on that design. And then that led to sort of a domino effect of him becoming more interesting. And then the editors being like, can we, we really like Emerald Knight. Can we do more with him? And then we kind of were revising that second arc to to bring him more to the front. Um, yeah, and actually, um, uh, I really like I really like the I really like the, his Alexander Luthor. I really like. Um, Cat Grant was only supposed to show up for that like kind of opening sequence in issue one. Mm -hmm. um, and we kept coming back to her just because I wound up liking her when he drew her as this really kind of heroic person. And like we were talking about, like the world needs more heroic people. So she shows up a couple times in the series when that wasn't really a thing we were planning on doing. Um, but yeah, I mean, every time Kieran would do something new and, and kind of put himself out there, it was it was it added to what crime syndicate was um and i'm actually really glad you asked this because it gives me the chance to like you know just say that out right like kieran has been amazing um and he has worked his butt off uh for this series and you know god willing he'll be doing comics for the rest of his life yeah i mean his art has been outstanding i absolutely love the the john stewart costume it reminded got a little bit of that star boy from legion of superheroes you know with the starfield um <laughs> And yeah, I think the Starfield was his idea, I think, um, you know, and then, the, you know, we went back and forth on different armors. There was like a Japanese like samurai armor at one point. Um, cool. Yeah, we, we went back and forth and, and that looked cool, too. It wasn't like it was it didn't look good. It just as as sort of those conversations kept going, like he kept going, oh, well, if we're going to go in that direction, then let's do something like this. And then he would change it and come come back and be, be great. And the, the, one of the, one of the uh, most interesting character design things is we went, we started with something very similar with Superwoman to what you see in the comic, but it, well, it didn't quite fit what everybody was thinking of, you know, in terms of her. And then we went like, we, we did all these designs that are way far afield of, of what it wound up being. <clears throat> and none of them were right. And we wound up basically going back to the original design making one change she had sort of a bigger s thing so we shrunk that down um and then we put on the the strap sandals and once <laughs> she had the strap sandals she looked perfect because it it said amazon but it also looked kind of fashionable and cool like she could like that would that could function in a fight and function like as an ambassador like i feel like those those sandals were the thing that that sold it so when <laughs> when kieran nailed that it was like that there she is like it was in such a simple little thing but it but it sold us all on on who she was and everything it was really it was that's like one of those things it's 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 amazing you know how much the right detail makes a difference yeah and it's a good example of you know maybe maybe you and karen aren't necessarily talking plot or story beats or anything like that but how much an artist can contribute to the writing process just in coming up with a design that then inspires you to go in a different direction or or be more additive or tweak a, a character in terms of of what their personality is or, or what their arc is um it goes back to that idea of comics is like yes the writer is important but the artist is just as important this is a collaborative media medium you know, and, and we're constantly fighting that battle of, oh, it's Grant Morrison's Doom Patrol or it's, you know, uh, Jeff Loeb's Batman Hush. But, you know, you got to talk about the artist. Don't just credit the yeah. right. And and I'd like to shout out. I mean, I know this is like a weird thing to say, but, but Kieran's design on Starro, I think, is great um, because we talked about Starro and he's generally depicted as more or less a regular starfish um, with an eyeball. And uh I talked about wanting the little like mini Starros. It would like, I wanted them to be more like, uh, like the face hugger and aliens, like in yeah. the med lab 
scene where they're like fighting that one face like like i wanted them to be like creepy and fast and scary i'm like i don't know how you do that in a comic like that's all based on motion and like all this stuff that like doesn't really work in comics but but that scene in uh that issue two starts with where they all like are flooding over on owl man's owl mobile that we never called an owl mobile like it's like he just nailed it and their 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 arms are all a little bit longer like it's definitely starro but like and i'm sitting there looking at that and i'm like it wouldn't surprise me if we saw this design creep its way into the earth one universe because i just i think it's great yeah well there's a scene in, in issue one as well uh, in fact let me let me pull it up here um where you see the starros and, and they're uh you know he's kind of shooting them out of himself and they look uh they don't necessarily look like like starfish they but they look very alien they look very uh menacing and like you said much more like the idea of the, the uh you know that face hugger i mean these don't necessarily look like starfish but they look scary as hell <laughs> you know yeah. like i mean yeah if that doesn't freak you out and uh, you know <laughs> ultraman is even saying uh you know nothing can kill me nothing can hurt me nothing can freaking scratch me but you know these things are freaking me out ultraman yeah. so yeah fantastic job by by kieran for sure uh, well, it's been great chatting with you, Andy. I, I, I definitely want to go back and reread. I probably won't even wait for issue six. I'm going to have to reread issues one through five with, with this, <laughs> armed with this new knowledge that you've given us. Uh, is there anything else that you wanted to, to ask Rocky before we let Andy go? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm actually kind of curious. Uh, in terms of what hit the cutting room floor, when, when, you, when you converted it from Black Label and it was no longer Black Label, was was your own sort of internal editorial process in your head how much did you actually have to cut was it mostly just brutally violent scenes or maybe the odd swear word here any nudity or could you tease us in terms of what got what, what you cut out and i'm just kind of curious as to how you go from a black label to you know what what ended up on the cutting room floor when you did that like i know that with uh, with damn batman damn we had the bat wang did we have the owl man hooter or something that was taken <laughs> out or or <laughs> No, well, I mean, part of it is we, you know, there wasn't a script at that point. So it wasn't like I had written a script for Black Label and then, and then had to convert it, um, which is good. But um, no, I mean, it was really mainly it was just condensing it because we, we lost the, the issues in the page count. That was the bigger, that was the bigger issue. And then, um, you know, there were some things I think probably would have been more brutal like i think like i said there was a thing in issue one so the first time you see the, and it, it, this still happens in the book the first time you we meet quick and atomica he's running through the city at super speed with a crowbar out and he's just he's just killing people <laughs> with it at super speed um and the like the original version of that like you were gonna see like heads and explode and eyeballs like flying through the air and stuff like that so that got <laughs> that got toned down and you know like i said like to some degree i'm kind of glad because i think a black label version of this you know and hopefully we would of course correct it if this if we notice this happening but it, it i think it could have veered into that you know more mean-spirited overly dark i mean the humor was always going to be a part of it um uh but uh but so i i think i prefer sort of the pg-13 version and i think this is a fairly at times it's a fairly edgy pg-13 you know certainly like with some of the, the sexual innuendo stuff that we talked about earlier but yeah. <laughs> um but uh it uh, yeah i don't think changing it from a black label affected all that much but you know taking eight page backup stories and turning them into four was challenging and then taking you know, 22 pages and getting that into 18, you know, I could have paced things a little bit differently. There are some, there are some, there are definitely moments in it. And I think, and Jace, I think you just listening to you earlier today, talking about issue five, like I, like, it, you know, like you were sort of saying something, I didn't really get that. Or I, or like, or like it just wasn't quite. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that wasn't quite the, like, I, I wish I just had a couple pages more where I could have built yeah. that up more so that it would have paid off like perfect but I didn't. <laughs> yeah, it's, and, out of, uh, it's out of your control. You know, we don't... Yeah, and you you know, and ultimately you're on a deadline. Like, I mean, at some point you you have to stop revising. You have to let it go because Kieran's got to have time to draw the thing, right? Yep. So, um, you know, there. But uh, DC was really good about any time that whenever the art got done, you know, I'd have you know a couple of days to to go back in with a script with the actual drawn art and revise, you know, any dialogue or captions that we wanted to revise and. You know, so they were really, they were really great about giving us the opportunities to, 
to do that back and forth, like like we were talking about in terms of the art comes in and then I react to the art and go, oh, well, the script could be better because look at this art. And, you know, the expression on that face would be perfect for a line like this, you know, yeah. or whatever. So, um, so that was good. Like in being cognizant of making sure that like the script isn't the only important thing. It's a important thing, but you got to give Kieran and Dexter uh, and Steve the time to bring all the life. And also like, honestly, one of the unsung heroes here, the unsung hero, because I think we've talked about just about everybody else is Rob Lee. Like his letters are amazing on this book because I have thrown so much stupid stuff at him. <laughs> and like every, every issue has like brilliant looking titles and all the backup stories have these great looking titles. Like, like he's got some sound effects that are amazing in here. Like every time he turns stuff in, I'm like, this guy is amazing and i never worked with rob before i'm so happy he's on the book because he's he's really fantastic yeah i mean letters they don't I, I always compare them to baseball umpires if they're doing their job you don't even notice they're there but if they screw it up uh everybody you know you'll notice <laughs> it, it's and he's done a great job because you know like you said there there, there are things that, that you had to cut be, because of uh you know space considerations and i've never one thing that you've nailed the entire time has been the pacing you know, despite the fact that you had to make cuts, um, it's been paced perfectly. And that the speed at which you read has so much to do with where the word bubbles are, word uh, balloons are on the panel and on the page. Uh, and he yeah. nailed it the entire time. So, yeah, he's been really fantastic. Um, yeah. I mean, I, there's, there's, there's not a bad egg on the, on the team. And I'm not just saying that because it would be really douchey to not say that, but uh, but it's legitimately true. Like Brian Hitch and Alex and Claire have been uh, fantastic on the backup stories. Like it's been like, it, it's very rare, you know, and I can say this having edited like a thousand comics, right? It's very rare that from the script to the pencils, to the inks, to the colors, to the letters, that each step it comes back to you and you go, oh, this is, this is better than the last time I looked at it. Yeah. Right. This, 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 the scripts may be good. Let's, I, I'll, I'll say, I hope they're good. Right. And then the art comes back and it's better. And then the inks come back and it's even better. And then the color comes back and you're like, we got ourselves a real comic here. Like this is a contender now. Right. But, it, but that evolved over the time, you know, it, it's, 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 you know, having a team that knows what they're doing, knows how to work together and, and produce something, uh, you know, and riff off of each other, which I think is, has been a big part of, what's made this book, you know, to the degree that it works is that's a big part of what has made it work. Yeah. I think this version of, of crime syndicate has so much potential and, and, you know, like Rocky said earlier, I hope we get a, a lot more of it, whether it's, it's yourself or somebody else coming in to, to give us their, um, their story with these characters, with these toys you've created. I, I think there's, there's so much potential. Um, so, so thanks again, Andy, for, for joining us. It's been a, a pleasure talking to you. Love to have you back on to talk generations. Uh, that, you know, we don't even necessarily have to talk about the way it changed because, you know, that's not necessarily, you know, I'm not looking to air any dirty laundry, but <laughs> I, I love I loved those two issues, man. Uh, what you and Rob and Dan Jurgens got to do. I mean, that was yeah, that was fantastic. Was that, was that a lot of was that a lot of fun, even though it, it changed from what you initially thought it was? Oh, it was that thing was just like it was just this roller coaster of like <laughs> you're canceled. Wait, no, you're back on. Uh, but the story is totally different now. OK, well, what do you guys want us to do now? We don't know. You figure it out. I'm like. So you just don't want it to be what it was, right? And then you like pitch something else, and that you know, and we I just had like all of these. We had these meetings, you know, uh, just amongst us, the you know, the the writers and editors, where we just pitched out, out like just tons of different ideas. Some of which, you know, and some of which like two of the three of us liked, right? Or one of us liked a whole lot, and the other two were like, eh, I don't know, you know. It was just like all this sort of, uh, you know, it was just. I've never seen a project like that before. And then, you know, even to the point where like, I don't know, we just, we landed on this thing. We all, we all seem to like it pretty well. Sure. Let's go for it. And then we do it. And then it like, it was such a, a chaotic soup that it didn't really become real. Like I wasn't even sure this project was going to happen like in my head, like until art started coming in and like I remember because I I uh in the first issue I wrote the little Teen Titans sequence that, that Yannick Paquette did and when I saw the spread of like the the Wolfman Perez uh Teen Titans by Yannick Paquette I was like oh oh this is real now okay this is like actually happening this is actually like, this gonna happen thing. And, and I wrote a thing that had like the Teen Titans, which were like my favorite super team when I was a kid, like, like, this is amazing. And then all of a sudden, 
like how I was approaching that project like completely changed because I was like, okay, this is a hundred percent about me just getting to do little things that I've wanted to do <laughs> and work with like awesome artists that I love to work with. Um, and all of the artists on that project were like absolute joys to work with. Um, you know, uh, so yeah, it's, it's that's so, so to me, uh, you know, as a podcaster and as a producer, that that song, okay. In five years, when you're allowed to talk, or ten years, when you're not allowed to talk, everybody involved is allowed to talk freely about it because enough time's gone by. We'll get you all together. We'll get a big bottle of bourbon or something like that. Everybody will have a nice glass, and we'll talk about what a roller coaster ride. That would be a blast, right? <laughs> I think that would be really, yeah. I think that would be really fun because it was it was amazing. And I and I said earlier that the the script that I turned in obviously has never been, you know, produced, never been drawn, but I was it's actually very rare that I turn in a script and I am like happy with it. You know, I, I tend to be somebody that's like, Oh, it's like 70% of the way there, but it's due. And, you know, I tend to be that. And I think the reason I liked that script is because the bulk of that script was a wonder woman story and wonder woman intimidates the ever living crap out of me as a character, like, <laughs> like writing a wonder woman, this, this icon that has meant so much to so many people like that just scares me right like what if i screw this up you know um i want to read that script now man i want to and read i was it. and i was pretty i was pretty happy with the, the take we had on, on one wow. and that doesn't yeah. mean that audiences would have liked it but i liked it oh, that, that, that 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 makes sense right that's just karma like the script that maybe you were the most happy with you've ever written of course ends up not ever seeing the light of day yeah so well i mean that's part of the reason that now i'm working on a bunch of creator owned stuff that i get to choose if it sees the light of day or not which also okay. means when i when i do my own crappy scripts i can like that one goes in a closet <laughs> right like <laughs> i'll have to produce that one well um, uh yeah I, I did want to give you a chance to, to plug anything is there anything far enough along that you can uh that you can tease it for us uh yeah no not yet not in terms of my own like creator own stuff i've got some stuff that's really close and we'll be doing like kickstarters and stuff like that but uh one of the reasons why i am so busy right now you know uh even while i was doing crime syndicate i run comics experience the comics education platform where we teach writing and art for comics it's all taught by working professionals um that's like that's my main job i also run ons printing which prints a lot of comics for a lot of independent creators we do a lot of kickstarters but we also print for a lot of small and medium-sized publishers um so i'm i, I have a work day right <laughs> but uh we recently launched comics experience publishing which uh the, our first issue drops in just a couple of weeks as of this recording at the end of july um or first week of august I'm not sure when it actually will land in shops stud and the blood blade number one will come out from cex comics experience publishing and yeah we're doing we're publishing creator owned comics by awesome creators but i will tell you running a publishing company even a very small one I knew it was gonna be a lot of work because I've worked for publishers for 20 years, but this is something else. I'm doing about 80 hour work weeks right now. Wow. I'm trying to sneak in and I've got my own, I've got my own podcast. I should, I should, oh, yeah. Why am I, why do I always forget to like talk about these things? But I've got the make comics podcast, the comics experience, make comics podcast, about 150 episodes deep at this point. Um, and then we just launched uh, some, some buddies of mine just launched franchise fan guys, which has taken off on iTunes. It's actually on uh, iTunes is, um, you know, front page for movie reviews and we do deep dives into whole franchises. So the first four episodes are all about the Terminator franchise and the next four are all about Jurassic Park. Uh, the ones that are coming out right now. So we just launched like two months ago uh, are about mission impossible. Um, we got, some really cool stuff coming up. In fact, when I get off here, I have to go watch some episodes, some not episodes, I guess, but movies of Nightmare on Elm Street. That's my homework for tonight. Nice, <laughs> nice. Well, where's the best place to, to follow along with all these different projects you have if people want to check out the, the franchise fan guys or comic uh, experience? Um, plenty, I mean, I'll tell you, we get a lot of aspiring comic creators that listen to us. So comic experience um, sounds yeah. like right up their alley. Yeah, comicsexperience.com and it's comics plural c o m i c o m i c s experience.com. Um, we're uh, 
it has its own Twitter at comic experience, not plural, because we didn't have 15 letters. So it's at comic experience to follow comics experience. Um, there's at CEX publishing for the publishing business, which is all creator owned. So, um, you know, that's something that might be of interest to a lot of comic creators. Um, and I'm at 39A Andy, that's two A's in the middle. Um, that's my personal Twitter where, you know, if you want to hear me rant at Jace for not loving Crime Syndicate, <laughs> that's that's your go-to. Um, so yeah, those are, those are the, you know, the, the, the websites are there, cxpublishing.com. Um, yeah. And then Franchise Fan Guys is just, it's on iTunes. And we've got a Twitter that's at Guys Franchise, I believe franchise fan guys didn't work so it's at guys franchise great um yeah it's, it's great stuff uh i love i love doing everything that i do um which is a problem because it means i can't pick one to stop doing so that i can breathe um but uh but yeah I, you guys know this i just got back from vacation and the whole time i'm on vacation i'm like you're working yeah i'm like floating down a river on an inner tube with a cooler of beer and i'm still like 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 messaging people it's like yeah, this it's needs so to happen get this contract yeah. going Got it. Got to keep, keep those plates spinning. I definitely know how yeah. that goes. So, well, like I said, Andy, it's been great chatting with you. Uh, everybody uh, out there on YouTube or, or, or listening on the podcast, I'll put links in the show notes to Andy's social media and the other uh, social media accounts and websites that he mentioned. So if you're having trouble finding something, just go to the show notes. You can click there and, uh, and find it. So definitely looking forward to the end of Crime Syndicate. Um, and I'll let you know if you end up hooking me at the, uh, at the end. <laughs> And the old, the old pushover Rocky, you know, you got him in the bag already. So <laughs> I've got Rocky's three ninety nine every month. That's you right. look, I'm watching you, Jace. I'm going to, I'm going to wait. I'm going to, I'm going to listen to your, your podcast review, assuming you talk about it and then oh, yeah. we'll, we'll chat after that. Yeah. I'll it's have to well. come back on to gloat once you're so <laughs> The door is always open. Right? The door is always open. So uh, to you listeners, we want to thank you for your support, for checking us out. As always, we really appreciate it. We wouldn't do it if you weren't out there listening. So uh, thanks for tuning in and we'll talk to you next time.